Hey guys, this is Roderick. I'm here today. I hope you guys had a great 4th of July. I hope you guys had a great week and I hope you guys are having a good weekend. So what I want to do today is talk about three distinct topics and kind of weave this in together, right? So the first thing we're going to talk about is slave movies, Kindred, the show on Hulu, and adapting a novel into a screenplay. So if you're new to this channel, this is where we review television, films, a little bit of reality television, all with an eye towards directing, acting, and filmmaking. So I wanted to kind of talk about this because I spent my Juneteenth this past June watching Kindred, the show on Hulu. I binged the whole show in like in a matter of two days. And it kind of raised like a, some very interesting topics kind of subjectively and objectively about the show. I'm not gonna do a bunch of heavy spoilers, but I will discuss the show, but I won't try to spoil anything for you. Um, and then kind of like reading kind of about slave movies in general and also about adapting subject matter for television and film. So if you watch my reviews for Mayfair Witches, you could also kind of refer to that of kind of how I deal with those topics as well. Um, but we'll get right into it, right? So the first question that came to me when I was watching Kindred, and especially with like thinking about Juneteenth, um, is about like, is there still an audience for slave movies, right? Um, before watching Kindred, the last slave movie I watched was 12 Years a Slave, right? Um, I saw it in the theaters the weekend it came out. I remember like traveling, like I was on the L uh, in Chicago, go actually watch it in Evanston. And I was on my way to the to the theater. The show started by crying like 10.30. And I was on my way to the theater. And I remember getting an alert on Twitter from Oprah's Twitter that said, oh my God, just watched Terms of the Slave. That tree scene took me out. So I was like, oh my God, what's about to happen? Nor, I was not prepared for the visceral reaction I would have on watching 12 Years a Slave, right? Um, I thought it was a great movie. I liked it. I thought it was well done. But if you're black and you're older than like 35, then you remember they used to show Roots every Black History Month, right? Um, and so we, in my family, we would watch Roots. I had seen Roots like a couple of times. Like growing up, my parents thought it was very important for us to understand really kind of where we came from and where we are as Black people um, in America. So I had watched Roots. And then there was Queenie, if you remember Queenie with Halle Berry. Um, and so, you know, I just kind of grew up watching those. And the older I became, the older I got, you know, you kind of have to take some time and get yourself mentally prepared to watch slave movies. Like you can't watch a slave movie after they'll work downtown in corporate America for eight hours and then go home at 6.30 and put on Roots or put on 12 Years a Slave or something like that. Like that would just totally mess with your spirit. So you really kind of have to get your mind and your spirit right to watch a slave movie if you're, especially if you're ADOS in America um, for any, have, having lived here for any kind of time because it will really try to vex your spirit and really have you looking, like leaving the theater feeling, any, you know, very angry black man-ish, angry black woman-ish when you're leaving. But as I was thinking about it, as I was watching Kindred, I was thinking, this is, I mean, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to play the argument from both sides because I don't want to be accused of, of trying to say yes or no either way because I'm just kind of positive this question for us to have this discussion. Is there really you know, an audience for slave movies anymore, right? And I'm thinking, I'm saying this subjectively and objectively, meaning the subjective part is what, you know, like, you know, are, are, are people still going to see these? Are people still feeling that it's important for their, for them and their black, for their families to see it? You know, is there really an audience for that, right? Because the question always is when you're making films from even from the development stage, all the way back to the writing stages, who's your audience, right? Every screenwriter, every filmmaker is all has to be thinking about who is your audience. And I wonder when you know you're doing something uh, when you're making something that's not existing IP, because because Kend Kendrick is something that's existing IP, meaning that it's coming from an existing intellectual property that's being developed. You know, I'm thinking like. Is there really an audience for that? And I can see both sides. I can see, yes, like there are, as long as America exists and there are still um, American descendants of slavery living in America, right? There will always be a need to show the stories of our ancestors who were enslaved and the, and the subsequent treatment of our ancestors after slavery ended. So yes, there is always will be a need and an audience for these type of films. However, I think as I say this, 
the need and the audience are sometimes different, right? Like the need for something and the people who actually will or watch it may actually may actually be different, right? It's kind of like your target audience is who you want to target. Your demographic are the people who actually buy the product right and so that's what the question is is that where is the overlap in the movies about slavery between the people who they're trying to target parentheses who exactly are they targeting and the people who actually end up watching is it ends up in, is it a circle like a venn diagram or is it really two concentric circles where there's an overlap somewhere in between so i just was pausing that as i was watching kindred and i was thinking you know on the other side that part of if you keep putting out these slave movies and these slave narratives, you know, I could see the argument where people are saying you're just keep retreading the past and you're not really moving us forward, telling any of our successful stories, any of our positive stories. But even as I say that, I recognize that both can both can coexist in the same space. Both can you can tell the history of our mistreatment and you can tell our successes and you know, despite those mistreatments but i kind of that's kind of one of the things that kendrick kind of kind of bubbled up when i was like watching this thinking to myself who were they really trying to target who was actually watching this and didn't really meet the audience kind of targets that of what they were looking for because <clears throat> we'll get to kendrick in a second but kendrick in a second but i was kind of like hmm whatever now the next thing i want to ask is let's talk about like knowing that there are people who view that slave movies are valuable and also they have a due value, you know, is their artistic and commercial value really in the same breath, right? Because, you know, we I have not watched Emancipation. I need to get my soul right. I will watch Emancipation, but I just have to get my soul right to watch it. I just got done with Kindred in June. It may be Christmas when I end up hitting, hitting Emancipation, right? And it may be after Christmas, because I still got to do, because I'm going to do A Color Purple, the musical movie, and on Christmas too, and you know what kind of, you know, fuckery that has in it. So I still may, you know, so I don't know. It may end up being New Year's Eve when I actually get to Emancipation. But, you know, like, is the, you know, what is the net artistic and societal benefit of slave movies? Does it net zero? Does it net plus one? Does it net positive one? And I can see both sides of this in saying that, yes, there's an artistic benefit of doing it. Because one of the biggest criticisms, you know, people of color or black people used to have is that the only time black people got nominated for awards and were celebrated was when they played slave movies or when they played movies where they were, you know, subjugated to lesser roles or whatever like that. And so now, you know, in 2023, I'm thinking about, is there still an artistic value for slave movies? And I don't know the answer to that. So I'm not going to come down yes or no. I'm just putting this out there for us to have that discussion because I think that I, whereas I don't believe the marketplace should always inform artistry, I think artistry has to have an eye towards the marketplace. And I'm just interested to see to know what is the marketplace of thinking about slave movies or slave narrative films. Because again, this was all coming from, and I think that a large part of this to be truthful, it came from Kindred and kind of like my thoughts about watching Kindred and just the way in which it was done. And I was just, that's kind of you know, what kind of caused this to bubble up. So let's get into Kindred real quick. So basically, I did not read Artelia Butler's book. Um, it was in my Amazon wish list. I wanted to read the book before watching um, the first season. I am kind of glad I did not because when I finished the series, I went to Wikipedia to get the kind of summation of what happened. And we find out that the entire first season is only the first three chapters of the book really and they made a lot of substantial changes to the book um that were that some of some changes some substantial changes to the show that were not in the book right because by the time i ended up watching the series and i went to the look and read to read the wikipedia about what happens i was like whoa 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 where was this where was this where was this so pretty much what the situation is this this is this is what what kindred is there is this 20 something year old woman named dana who literally is jumping from the past to the present, right? And in the course of her jumping to the past, the present, to her to the slave times, she meets this guy named Kevin, and then she ends up jumping to the past with Kevin too, and her and Kevin, who's all who's white, or you know, in this interracial relationship, and they're living in the past, in the present, and Dana has to navigate this whole situation. She can come back. She can't really control when she comes and when she goes. 
And, you know, obviously being a black person from, I think this is a 2016. Um, so she's 20 something in 2016, jumping back to like 18, I think it's 1841, 1851. So it's pre-Civil War, but still in the middle of slavery to a plantation in Maryland, right? So when watching, I thought that was a really good premise. I was like, well, that's good, right? Because now thinking about like when you're adapting a show, you're not, you're jumping from present to past, but you're doing it in a way where the character is continuous throughout all the entire series, right? So I was like, okay, well this, we won't have to worry about these kind of like mushy flashbacks that aren't really like in giving us too much, like the characters moving from back and forth. I think the problem with, first of all, I, the character of Dana as, as she's presented in a television show was not likable at all. Like I did not like her character because she moved too brand new for me. And I may just be a generational thing. I could tell that her character, she's like 20 something. She had moved from New York to LA. She sold her grandmother's penthouse, which causes some, some family disturbances and decides to buy a house without telling anybody. Okay, fine. But if you're, you know, in your 20s, 27 and 2016, okay? My assumption is, and maybe again, drop down in the comments and tell me if I'm wrong. My assumption is that most black people in their 20s as of 2016, especially she like went to a decent college, has some kind of substantial or intermediate knowledge of topography of the past, of the 1800s, of being black in America. Dana moved when she was on the plantation like she was on the streets of LA, just being brand new as fuck, just really moving very recklessly and carelessly and not really thinking about the sociological constructs that were, that were going on at that time that I think that any black person would be acutely aware of. Now, whether or not you want to conform to those things is between you and your Jesus. But you, but Dana just moved as if she was just very, very brand new. Like at one point she did kind of wisen up and they went to the store to kind of like the next time she jumped back, she had some things from, uh, from the present time to bring back. That was like the smartest thing she did throughout this entire season, right? And I just was like, very annoyed with like that her character so it was very hard for me to like her for me to be invested in her and the journey and the conflicts and the travails i thought the other characters were far more interesting from rufus you know the the plantation owner to rufus's wife to you know the field, the head, the head field guy that who played that slave, that's made, played that slave. He was fantastic. I loved him. Everybody else was more interesting than Dana herself. Even Kevin was far more interesting, and he was the white man who was being pulled. And I felt that because they were had made made some changes to from the book to the television show, they missed an opportunity. Right. So just like Dana was moving brand new, right, jumping from. 2016 to the 18 to 1840, 1850 or whatever like that. And we're not seeing, because her jump time, we never saw what she did in between her jump time, like during the day where she's working, where she's traveling. We couldn't see, like if I went from today and I blinked and I was on a plantation and I blinked to get up back, there's gonna be some substantial changes in how I move with other black people and in how I move with white people. And because they have moved it, I guess in the book it's set in 1970, I would rather have seen Dana between jumps, if you're changing things, right? Showed how she moved differently in relation to black people and white people having these jumps back and forth to the plantation. Same thing with Kevin. Here's this white guy, he's dating a black woman. He, you know, whatever, well, he's fine, benign, whatever. But being out, being in a plantation, being like forced to kind of pretend that your girlfriend is really your slave, you're gonna move differently when you come back to the present with against other white people and other black people, whether positively and negatively. And I feel like they really missed an opportunity there to really show what that profound effect would be. Because if you're setting it in the modern times and people and with all the knowledge we know about marginalized people and black people, I felt like they missed a really huge opportunity there with Kevin and with Dana because I feel like it would have made Dana more likable and Kevin's presence in the past and in the present more relatable and having more substance to it, right? Which leads me to my next point, right? 
So if you've watched my videos on Mayfair Witches, you we know the tragedy that is Mayfair Witches that I will not go back over again. But one of the things that was kind of brought to light when watching Mayfair Witches is how people adapt, um, you know, existing IP, especially novels, to um, television and film, right? And I think one that I will say that one that I was very spoiled because I love the Harry Potter films, a huge Harry Potter fan. And those screenwriters really did a very good job of adapting what was a very thick and just packed full of set of books, you know, those books like 500, 600, 700 pages into a really great screenplay, right? The only one I kind of was like, eh, I didn't like this, I didn't like that adaptation as much was, excuse me, The Order of the Phoenix because there's this one chapter in the book or really the, the fight between Dumbledore and Voldemort was very different in as it was in the book as it was the end. And I felt that the book fight was a lot, had a lot more weight and had a lot more substantial meaning than what they did in the film. But overall, I mean, that's talk, that's quibbling over like a B plus to a B minus, right? So, but I'm thinking about, as I'm looking at these shows and we're seeing a lot of adaptations, some of them are just really missing the mark. Right now, I can I cannot say whether Kindred missed the mark or didn't miss the mark because I didn't read the book. Right, so I'm just saying based upon what I know the book to be and what I saw, I just was just going like, huh? Because again, as I discussed in the Mayfair Witches or whatever, choices are only mistakes if they don't go to your favor. Right? I mean, that's just how everything else is life. Right? An artist makes a choice about a film, a painting you know, a television show or screenplay, and then that choice either works or it does not work, right? So, and I'm never going to sit in judgment of someone else's choice because I wasn't there to make that choice, but I just kind of question always the work that goes behind there because some of the changes that they made from the book into the um, television series, I see kind of on a surface level why you think that would be make sense, but it just did not make sense or didn't really have the effect that they would do. Like they added an extra character um, from the book to the television show for, I guess, dramatic and emotional effect, but it really just didn't land the way it did because the character was started making the making ridiculous choices, and I was just like, well, why are they doing this? Well, why are they doing that? That makes no sense, right? And to just have only covered three chapters of an entire book for your first season, I think that's ballsy, right? Like, I don't know. I, I think that I would have rather have covered the entire book through the first season. And then if there are other books that could have tied into this or done whatever, I think that you you miss out because we don't you don't know if every show is going to get renewed. I would have done and I would have stuck my Mary Lou Retton landing on the first season doing the first whole book in doing that. And then if we get a second season, we're either going to do something else or different, or we can continue the story and take artistic license uh, with something else. So that's kind of thing. But I think that people, when you're thinking, when you're adapting a existing IP to a screenplay, you have to decide first whose story is it, right? That's the first thing. You have to decide whose story is it. The second thing you have to decide is who is going to be our, you know, who is going to be our antagonist, right? If you decide who our protagonist is, then you have to decide who is going to be the antagonist, right? And then once you determine that, then you can go in this, then you can start to build your world, right? But so many times, you know, you can't, I mean, very few movies do well with dual, with two antagonists except for Batman Returns, which is one of my favorite films. But very few films do well with dual antagonists, right? So if Dana's going back to slavery times, they, slavery times in 1841 is the antagonist, right? So if you're inserting somebody else, then they need to be worse than slavery times in 1841, you know? So that was one of the things, it was like, well, damn, like, you know, like I, I just did, I think I, you could just tell that they were making choices and I understand kind of the math behind the choices, but it just did not end up landing and doing whatever. And I think it's unfortunate because going back to our previous discussion, these stories do have value. There are, there are people who should be watching this, who need to watch these type of films. And I just hate that, it, you know, because it didn't get renewed for a second season.
right? And I hate that because now there's lots of things in this story to be told and we're not gonna finish it. And that's really unfortunate considering how many other subpar shows do get renewed that don't hold the same artistic and societal value, right? And I think that's the tragedy of Kindred, right? Is that, you know, and, and that's just that, and that's the tragedy really of being a black person in Hollywood. Like you have to stick your landing with everything you do because you're not gonna get that many second chances, right? So anyway, I just wanted to kind of like put that out there and weave those kind of three topics together because you know, watching Kindred just kind of rose up, made me thinking about like slave movies in general, you know, that, which I would love to know what you all thought of this show um, and kind of like what, what, what your thoughts were about this show. And, you know, and again, like having my Mayfair witches trauma of whatever, thinking about like adapting um, existing IP because I don't know, it just, you it's a talent, you know, uh, Adapting, you know, an existing IP, a novel to a screenplay, to a television show is a talent and is something that is honed and refined and you have to know what you're doing with it. And I've just kind of seen a lot of misses that are out there and I'm just like, oh gosh. So anyway, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Uh, be safe and I will talk to you guys soon. Bye. Oh, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. Bye guys.